<laughs> what do you mean? You know, I was, I was asking, is that the great colleague? Not that that's like, oh, the, 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 <laughs> not like that's a question that's hard to answer. He's a pretty well recognizable guy. Well, no, well, see, but what if there's another guy that looks like the great colleague? Such as. Well, that's right. That's what I thought. You can't. Well, no, no, okay. All right, you can't you can't do that, okay? It's not it's not fair. There's there's no other person like the great Kali, and I think I'd stand by this. If you could find no. if you could find me a photo of somebody who looks like him, I would be astounded. Okay, I'm looking up great Kali clone. Okay. Uh, the <laughs> first video I see is Great Kali versus Alien. <laughs> I'm just not. You're not. You're not gonna find a similar man. I'm looking up great Kali lookalike right now. Hey, motherfucker, little other man, 2012, you heard me? Coming at this bitch, fuck all these motherfucker haters, you hear me? This how we doing it, man? Yeah, motherfucker. Is that motherfucker doing it in his bitch? Bitch, I'm a roast and lugubrious. Okay. I'ma let the oozy spit. Okay. Turn his face into gooey shit. Bitch, bitch, I'm a roast and lugubrious. Okay. I'ma let the oozy spit. Okay. Turn his face into gooey shit. Why? Bitch, I'm a roast and lugubrious. Okay. I'ma let the oozy spit. Okay. Turn his face into gooey shit. Bitch, bitch, I'm a roast and lugubrious. Okay. I'ma let the oozy spit. Okay. Turn his face into gooey shit. Why? It's time for an agenda pushing session. <laughs> the heaviest agenda Woo! podcast so far. Welcome to Scramble Bunkhouse Deathcast, episode three, where it's John, Cake, and myself talking about wrestling and whatever match and agenda we have to push at that given moment. Last week we had a really interesting conversation about survivalism. And the great Hobo Hank, who proves that it doesn't really matter the quality of the in-ring wrestler, as long as you embody something that few wrestlers embody, that is the spirit of something like a survival Tobita or a Hobo Hank, where you will make wrestling happen regardless of your limitations in the best ways you possibly can. And today, I'm here to talk about a man who has expressed not his limitations, but his influences on his sleeve and has influenced more wrestlers than we will ever know. And that is the man who I compared to Walter White in this image over here, Shinjiro Otani. It's a, the man it's a himself. crazy way to introduce him. You could say that he's like a multi-time IWGP junior champion. He's a, probably won a lot of belts in Zero One. He like owns the company. Uh, no, he's, he's similar to Walter White, Shinjiro Otani. Well, yes. Uh, but yeah, we we yeah, are anyways. talking about Otani, who is, you know, there's a lot of things that can be said about him. Uh, of course, the thing about Walter White. But of course, also, the fact that he's one of the best wrestlers, like, ever. Um, one of the, as you said, one of the most influential wrestlers ever. Uh, at one point, there was a whole group of guys in Japan who all wore, like, rip-off sparkly Otani jackets. Uh, mm -hmm. And Otani just took them all under his wing and was like, you guys are my sons now. <laughs> um, like, he, he's, he's a guy that not even just in Japan, like, all around the world, his influence on wrestling is fucking absurd. I was going to get into this later, but since you brought it up now, okay, let me get the agenda off right away. <laughs> Shinjiro Otani is not only one of the most influential wrestlers of all time, he's proof that if you show your influences in the right ways, you can be influential and phenomenal on your own. Like, him and Yuki Ishikawa are two guys who very heavily embody what Antonio Inoki wanted in pro wrestling, but Otani brought his own junior heavyweight flair to it. He worked with a lot of guys who have done tours in Mexico, if not Mexican wrestlers, occasion, but like 
when he was younger, he would bring in different aspects, specifically from what we would consider shoe style, but is more of Inoki's like brand of what he believes wrestling should be. And he's yeah. just kind of the perfect junior heavyweight embodiment of that in a lot of ways. And so many people gravitated towards that, even if they don't realize that they've been influenced by Inoki, but more heavily by Otani. And you could say, you could make this argument that without Shinjiro Otani's influence, the early 2000s Ring of Honor, specifically American indie scene, would look a lot different than it does today. No, I'd, uh, yeah, I, I, okay. Because then we have to start playing the game of trying to guess how much, what, what tapes guys are specifically watching. I would say, definitely without a shadow of doubt, he had a pretty damn strong influence on not just Ring of Honor, but like just the entire American indie scene around that time. Yeah, like, very much so. just the way he would work as a junior heavyweight uh, seemed to really rub off on a lot of people that watch his work. Um, and there, of course, also are like fucking like Joe. Joe's the big one, he does the Otani boot scrape, but like. Just also a lot of junior heavyweights around the time, just the way that they would just, you know, bang, 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 fucking high octane, like, working. Because, of course, Otani's not a fucking, he's not a spot guy, per se. He could do that. He's done it before, but he's not, at his core, a spot guy. But the way he would work matches with just so much going, and, like, there's such an energy to Otani's work that is like, prevalent all over the indies of the 2000s. It also helps that a lot of the indies of the 2000s just worked with the guy. Because yeah. <laughs> Zero One was handing out excursions for like, yeah. a lot of people. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, a direct influence is definitely better than, uh, I watched this tape and I want to be like this guy. Because then you actually work him, or you're, you're in a locker room with him. Um, yeah. And I, and, I, and I think that the topic of unintentional influence or unrecognized influence is very real because you're definitely if you're watching a guy who is who's influenced by Otani and you're influenced by that guy um, you could kind of argue that the uh, trickle down influence ladder could exist um, yeah I think I think it's kind of unfair to you know completely erase like the influences you get from that guy because he was influenced by a different guy first um, yeah because at the end of the day, I think that personally, there's there's always like a line to be drawn where maybe you just had an idea that you've always wanted to do, um, and it's just because you were born later that you're never gonna get credit for it because some guy would just happen to be born before you, <laughs> which is definitely a thing that I think could happen in a lot of situations. Um, and I think it's important to look at Tony's legacy, um, from a, from that perspective. For example, like if you were to look at it from the perspective of if somebody happened to be born before Otani, would they have done it first? Um, yeah. And I think you could argue that no. I think the people who have been influenced by Otani, were they fortunate enough to have been born earlier on in life than Otani? I think they would have wrestled differently than they had. Yeah, 100%. Um, what did you say, Ethan? Oh, no, I was just agreeing with you. Oh, yeah. So speaking of Otani's work, yeah, you know, I think if like if we're gonna talk about Otani, we do need to start off with fucking his junior work. And yeah. the first match we watched was very much his junior work. It was uh fuck, what was the date? It was Jiro Otani versus uh El Samurai from oh, January twenty first of nineteen ninety six in New Japan. And it's a very famous one too. At least yeah, yeah. In the, uh, <laughs> cultural zeitgeist. I... It is... Sorry, but it is the like canonically great New Japan Juniors match. If you want to watch something from around the nineties, and I'd say rightfully so, because yeah, I, feel, I feel like it's probably a Liger match that's more canonized just because it's Liger. Um, I was gonna say, but there's if you probably like, remove him from the equation. It's probably Otani and Sam. Yeah. I will say, I somehow, some way, I had never seen this match before. Today. Like, I've heard about it, 
I've absolutely seen clips from it, uh, but I've just never seen it. And yeah, I I get why it's canon. <laughs> it is it is a pretty damn stellar piece of work. It is so well built in like like they very very much came into this match with a plan. Like you can tell just from the way it's worked that they are very clearly they they had intentions going in of everything they were gonna do. Uh, it all fucking worked. Um, and I think that that goes good into talking about one of the biggest things that I noticed with Otani's work. And it appears in the second match we talk about too, but not as much. But in this match, uh, Otani, like, kind of, as Otani has gotten older, one of the big things, like, Otani's a very bombastic guy. He's fucking <laughs> crazy facial expressions. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, so much energy and everything. But Otani also is just, like, a really great wrestler when it comes to, like, the little details of everything. Like, there's that moment pretty early on where they're just doing mat work. And everything Otani's doing is, like, really, like, like getting as much as he can out of it. And at one point, he's got him in, uh, I, I guess, like, a heel hold? I don't even know the exact terminology, but just, like, the got the leg trapped with the other leg. And yeah. he starts, like, grinding his, like, elbow into Samurai's knee. And that's, like, disgusting. Like, I have not seen a lot of people that, like, guys do that. But just, Otani is so great at, like, peppering all this shit in. Very much. Hey, as somebody who saw this match a while ago, what were your takeaways on it specifically? Not even just for Otani, but also for El Samurai, because you specifically said that you were watching this match more for him. Yeah, because I have only ever seen this match once before. I'm not really. I don't rewatch a lot of matches just because there's a lot of wrestling. And yeah. Most of it is that great on a rewatch. Um, but the first time I watched it, I liked it a lot. Um, and the second time that we were watching it for the pod, I did want to hone in on El Samurai just because I was very taken in by Otani the first time I watched it, which I think everyone probably will be because, like John yeah. mentioned, he is, um, he's very, very active during this whole thing. Um, and he's just like, he's reacting in just such a, just almost like, um, like a, like an old expressionist silent movie in a way. Of just how insane his facials are, as if he just wasn't allowed to speak, so he had to make up for it by looking in just unbelievable. And the way he like, falls too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of it. A lot. His whole body moves like he is a a Buster Keaton in many ways. His whole body just moves yeah. like he's a silent film star who is restrained by not being able to make sounds. So he's now moving to make up for all of that. <laughs> And he's, Which he's is awesome, awesome because he wears a Charlie Chaplin mustache of blood for like the second act of this match. That's insane, but I mean, I, I, you're right. You are right. He certainly does, doesn't he? He certainly <laughs> does, doesn't he? Um, I felt like I will admit I felt like it was a bit much at times because it, um, his his expressions for the most part are very reined in, but there was a period of time where. Uh, El Samurai had him in a, in a key lock, and when it cut to Otani's facial expression, he looked like one of those like uh, like those TikTok actors, you know, the ones who are like, oh, my son just died, <laughs> and they're like no. sobbing, and there's snot coming out of their nose, and they're like, looking like they've had the most traumatic experience of all time. Um, which thankfully, I only felt that like that once, but I think if you were to watch it, and you're not one for melodrama, it helps that he's consistent, and he does it the whole time. But there are certain instances like, okay, man, he does not need to be doing all that. I think that's part of the reason why I am somewhat forgiving about Otani is that you mentioned it. That's just Otani. Like, yeah, it's just, not he's like he's... With it. And he commits fully, which is a good thing. Yeah. Plus, he's wrestling in front of his dad. Of course. That is true. Which, I will say, I don't want... I do have to say, that doesn't really play into the match. I get that it's a cool note. But I do love that at one point, uh, I think Samurai just kind of kills him with something. I can't remember what he killed him with. Samurai fucking kills him with something. Cuts over to fucking Chinjiro Otani's dad. He's just sitting there, not moving. Like, he's just looking like, ah, look at what happened to him. Look like, at what happened, whatever. <laughs> I, yeah. I want to go back home. 
And I yeah, and I, I watched it again for El Samurai because, like I said, I was too honed in on Otani the first time around. So the second time I was watched just El Samurai, and he does a really, really, really good job. And I think a lot of people are gonna are like I said, just gonna be gravitationally pulled towards Otani doing his thing, especially when El Samurai is completely facially covered. Like you, like yeah, you can't really compare facials because he has none, and Otani is going crazy with selling, so Samurai is a lot more restrained, but he also has, I think, the sickest bumps and sells out of the entire match. Yeah. Like for Otani, um, you know, like, almost practically doing, like, the, uh, holding arm and pointing at it for a couple instances, El Samurai yeah. has the better sells, man. Like, there's a period of time where he just does the, he almost does an accidental split off of a drop. <laughs> it was, sounds corny but then you watch it and you're like oh no this, i see what you mean now his um, like fucking leg like splits like it just like goes the wrong way <laughs> there's, there's a period of time where he uh he gets hit so hard that like he lands on the guardrail and it just the wings open <laughs> with him actively still on it yeah and and like again this these all seem like very over the top things when you're hearing it but in the way that he does it it just feels like this is naturally the only thing that could have possibly happened to him yeah. Um, which is, I think, a stark contrast to Otani, which, like, you know, I do still like his mannerisms in this match, man, but it feels like a bit much, especially especially when Samurai is doing a much more subdued version of his whole thing. Yeah. And I, like, I completely respect that opinion. I disagree that it's a little bit much because, you know, my... Tolerance for melodramatic bullshit is slightly higher, but also I do think it's a, like very close to being too much for me. On the second watch, I was like, okay, this is a little more egregious than I remember. I feel like if I watch it again, it will be. But I do agree on the fact that uh, Samurai has one of the best selling performances I've seen like in New Japan's junior heavyweight history. Because he is, his leg gets so small and just misaligned throughout the whole match. I had to clutch my knee when I was watching it because I was like, oh, no, I do not want this to happen. That would, if that happened to a normal person, their knee would hurt for the rest of their life. I mean, it probably did for Samurai, but like, he, he had training. Shit. If you don't have training, that is going to spread any possible ligament and probably like four new ones that you've never even heard. Very, 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 very much so. Very much so. And I do think that that goes into, you know, what we need to talk about because the big thing with this match is the limb work. You know, that's like, pretty much talking- the entire match's whole thing is that uh, Otani is an. I, w- I was going to say Otani's an animal. Both these guys are animals. This is a really animalistic match. Both these guys are so, like, just genuinely ferocious with everything. And not even just, like, when they're going for the limbs. Like, Otani is ripping at Samurai's leg. He's, like, constantly going for heels, constantly trying to bend the ankle the, like, the wrong way. Meanwhile, Samurai is, like, hunting for double wrist locks and hunting for, like, cross arm bars. And every time he gets it, he, like, pulls his whole body back as far as he can, like, wrench it as much as he can. Uh, but even on defense, like, there's this insane moment. Because Otani, of course, you can, I feel like I don't even have to explain that he's, like, animalistic. Just at one point, he straight up, like, I think it's, uh, yeah, the double wrist lock. He just bites <laughs> Samurai's fucking thigh. Or, like, his, like, just his leg until he lets go of the hold. Samurai oh, is arm. not, uh... What does he bite? I think it was an arm. Yeah, I believe Oh, yeah, yeah, cross yeah. Arm. Okay, cross... Yeah, you're right, it was a cross arm. He just bites his leg. Uh, Samurai is not... Calves. Sorry. Oh, he bites yeah, he bites the calves. Uh, Samurai is not, uh... It's not like Samurai's just on defense there, though, because it's fucking earlier than that. Uh, you know, we mentioned Otani gets, like, a bloody nose, which... We don't really know what caused it. I think Ethan said that it seemed like he, like... It seemed like Samurai kind of, like, hit him in the face with his leg. 
what going for like a double wrist lock or something. Like he, uh, uh, it, it felt like he when he went over to flip over for the arm bar, it almost looked like his nose like smushed and like grazed for a while against the uh, El Samurai's thigh. So I think that's yeah. what did it, just like pressing the nose against his thigh. Yeah, but he his nose gets busted. And then, Ooh, like, man. fucking Otani, like, goes for, like, some type... He, like, he's, like, got him in a fucking heel hook. And Samurai is, like, trying to grab at, like, the broken nose. Mm-hmm. So, like, just, like, grab at it and make him, like, go. Which is fucking crazy. Uh, but these two guys are just constantly ripping at each other's limbs. This whole match is just two guys trying to force the other guy to give up by any means necessary and doing everything they can to damage the limb further and further. Otani's throwing insane fucking drop kicks to the to the leg. Two different springboard drop kicks. And we talked about the one that did the split. I'm gonna be honest. I think the one after that was even worse because the way it connected, like fucking samurai's leg went in. Like it went inside. <laughs> like it's not how the leg's meant to bend. Um and of course, you're not supposed to do splits like that either, but it just is not. It's not natural. It's not natural in any way. You're gonna need and to fucking to, like remind me. Did Otani do? He did like a normal swan dive drop kick, right? Like, just, he did like, just to the body, not to the leg. Yeah, he did one to the back yeah. of the yeah. head near the end. Because that's what I was thinking of was that like given how so that's something I was thinking of when we were watching is that it's it's a very fifty fifty match, like almost entirely. It is. It is mm-hmm. incredibly back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because nobody really they're they're just so. Similarly minded of, I want to kill this guy, but not not all this guy. I just want to kill part of this guy. I just want to kill just <laughs> one part of this guy right now. And it's it, you know it's it's just such a deadlock because both guys are just being evil animals the whole time. And yeah. I think what gives Samurai the edge actually is when Otani has his moment and he's like, I'm feeling it. I'm going nuts. I'm going crazy. He resorts to what works, which typically is a good yeah. thing, but He's, he goes to the dragon suplexes, he goes to the swan dive drop kick, and he he goes to his moveset that in a traditional, you know, Lucha Rezu match would probably secure him the victory, but this isn't traditional. It, nothing about it. Well, okay, it was, but you, you know what I mean. Like, this, it, it wasn't standard fare for Otani in the way that it was being presented. So him going to the moves that always worked I think was to his detriment because when when he hits the dragon suplex, El Samurai just takes the arm and he's okay again. Um, when he hits the Swan drop kick, it's not that much longer before Samurai just goes for his appendage. And I think it's because Samurai just sticks with the game plan, whereas Otani gets a bit too overzealous and just goes back to yeah. acting like this is just another match for him. I yeah. think that's the turning point. I think that's the turning point, at least. I'm sorry, I just, uh, hold on. Okay, I'm home. How did you get that that gets, man? That Jesus. point gets five Zandig screams out of five because I didn't know how to word it exactly, but you said exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. Which Dude, is that's like, a crazy sh- fucking five Zandig screams. I think you should never weird. use that scale again. I think you should No, retire. no, we're. We're getting rid of that. I'm taking getting rid of the soundboard. Rid Fuck of that you. That's now. crazy. That's no funny. way. Never do that I'm again. That... I'm so glad that fucking Claude doesn't record any of that shit. Craig that doesn't record any of that shit. Um, yeah, no, I fully agree. Uh, and I do think that's really noteworthy because the fucking finish is like Otani does get overzealous and fucking. And I think the most interesting thing is that. You know, Samurai at first he counters by doing the tornado DDT, which is really sick. But instead of like trying to chain together more moves, he immediately goes up, does that nasty fucking knee drop to the arm, and then immediately walks in across arm bar. So even when he's doing well, he does the, uh, the arm break too before that. Yeah, he yeah. does the yeah. arm break. Uh even when he's doing like more pro wrestling stuff, this fucking Samurai, you know, Otani's not alone. Samurai busts out a stunner at one point. Uh but even if like they're not they're he's not alone. Samurai still feels like he's more zoned in on the arm than Otani is on the leg. Yes. And when Otani would continue to do normal stuff, 
Samurai is very aware of, I need to get back to the R. Which is, I think it's also especially fair because uh, Samurai was the one with the, uh, the the larger control at the start of the match, you know? He was the one who began the limb work fast. And like, yeah. Tony was kind of almost doing it in like an oh yeah type of way. Like, oh really? You're going to work my limb? Well, I can work <laughs> yours too, buddy. So, yeah. Again, I think that plays in the mindset. Otani was just kind of wanted to wrestle a match and then felt like he was being threatened. And then once he thought he proved his point, he went back to wrestling a match, and that's when he got owned. Yeah. Um, that's I like sorry. that's that's what I it, I don't know if this makes any sense, but well, it's going to make sense. I don't know why I thought I was going to make a different comparison, but <laughs> it, this is just pro wrestling is supposed to work it's that you introduce something in the first act of the match which is the limb work which is like the first part of the match is really hammering home the point of these guys are trying to break each other's limbs as quickly as possible and as like brutally as possible and making that kind of the background focus for the second fall or not the second fall but the second act where they're more focused on pro wrestling moves than anything. And then in the third act, you bring it back around. And they did it in a really satisfying way, better than like a lot of pro wrestling I've seen. Yeah. Which is what I really enjoy about this match, is that it kind of has that, I don't know. It's something that you normally see in American pro wrestling, especially from like the 80s or the territory, the territory days or like the WWF in the 80s. But it's that like that feeling that everything in a match matters and is going to come up at some later point and matter even yeah. more. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. something that I don't know if wrestling like does as well from what I've seen lately. I think it's something that wrestling can do better than most other mediums besides like the long running TV show where they can put a plot line in the background and have it cook for a few seasons and then boom, it just blows up in everybody's face later. I think that that's a, and that's a really important note with it is that the, you know, of course the limb work is the main focus, but above all else, it's the through line of the match. It's what keeps the match grounded. Cause this match you know, these two guys involved, this era of wrestling, both these guys are junior heavyweights, this could have devolved into just a bomb fest. Mm -hmm. It would have been a cool bomb fest, it would have been fine, but the presence of that limb work keeps it all connected, Uh, and I think that's part of the reason why when it does kind of become a bomb fest near the end, a lot of the bombs are still predicated on the limb work. It feels like it is a bomb fest that, like, fully deserves to happen it, it is reasonable it is not just them busting shit out it is it's driven it is a driven bomb fest that is predicated on a through line of limb work that you know leads to the finish mm-hmm. there's one perfect example of that in the match which is when tawny german suplexes samurai and then yeah. samurai immediately grabs the key lock that's like i've seen that spot done a lot uh because that's I I, yeah. I don't know if this was like the first time it happens. I sh- I'm certain this is probably the match where it happened, and then people were like, "We need to do this spot for us." Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I feel like that spot happens like once a fucking year in like a notable match, mm-hmm. um, and you know, deservedly so. It's a really cool spot. Sometimes it feels kind of stupid. Uh, it depends on how you've built up to it. Like, and that's part of the reason why it works so well in this match is because it is built great that might you know i want to say like oh the drop kick to the back of the head that made fucking samurai do the swing on the railway or the drop kick to the leg that like bends it samurai's leg inward like i want to say those are my like favorite spots of the match my favorite spot of the match might really just be that key lock spot because like it is so well done german suplex lands there's like a good second of pause mm-hmm. between when it lands and like, you know, the ref's going down for the pin and then fucking Samurai. You can, it's not even that he hits the German and then he goes into it. He hits the German. You watch Samurai like pry Otani's like hands apart and then pull in the key lock. So it's like he has to force it to happen. And I think the only other time I've seen that spot done that good was fucking 
Like in 2021, I saw someone do it like in midair. And it was like, okay, this like works because fucking the one big problem with that spot is that sometimes the German hits and immediately the guy's got a key lock in. It's like how the you fucking hit a German, you have like a you have a good grip in because you have to get a good grip to do a German. Yeah. Like, how'd you break that shit within a millisecond? This like this comp- and, like also how'd you break it within a millisecond after getting dropped on your head? You watch Samurai do it in this match. You watch him do it, and it's so. So fucking well done. I, I fucking love that spot so much. It's a very, very good spot. Um, and I've also argued that... Um, well, actually, I'm just going to argue for the second match on the on the docket, more, more importantly. Because that was the... I preferred this one, personally. But this is just... This, the second match to be watched just... Fulfilled my own personal tastes a lot more, even if I think it maybe it yeah. was thought out as well. Um, <laughs> but it was just cool. It was sick as hell. Uh, what yeah. year was it? it doesn't matter. So this was Shinjiro Otani versus Kazunari Murakami from June fourteenth, two thousand one, in zero one. Specifically, this is on the Shingeki shows, which is just just for context. Shingeki was basically, uh. Hashimoto saw Pride <laughs> and was like, this is pretty sick. Mm-hmm. So Shingeki was a show where everyone put on gloves and they uh, beat each other up. Um, it's basically Zero One's fucking... Brawl like, for all. It, Basically their Brawl for All. I was going to say shoot style, but Brawl for All is a better way to describe it, because a lot of it was just guys punching each other in the face. Uh, fucking Fuji- Fujiwara would come in and do like technical work. I'm sure Ishikawa did technical work. Uh, but a lot of it really was just guys running in there and just punching the shit out of each other. It's a point this match. Also, yeah. <laughs> I think you and I have the same brain connection that everybody has once they have like achieved a certain level in the egg, which is because you mentioned the second match just as I was about to ask if everybody was ready to go on this onto the second. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, we are, we are locked in. This is how you know this not, is an official, real podcast. I did not. Uh, I did not attribute my love for um, sick men doing sick things to the egg, because I think that's always been built into my brain. Um, yeah, no, I was saying like I would, I would, I would prefer to attribute it to the egg. I know. I, I would prefer to attribute it to the egg because that would mean there's not something like deeply wrong with my psyche. But unfortunately. <laughs> Tragically, I have to admit that I just enjoy watching people get hurt. Yeah, I, I felt it in the air. You know, we're fucking, we're talking about oh, this, you know, really smart limb work and match structuring and through lines and shit. Uh, but I think we all kind of felt in the air that the time has come to talk about Cousin oh, Murakami, also known as Satan. <laughs> Evil. I don't know about any. The devil you've ever seen. I've never seen the devil with that kind of an uppercut or a drop kick. I'll be honest. I, Dude. I don't think I've ever seen a wrestler as just genuinely demonic as Murakami, dude. Yeah. He just no, he's this, this feeling about even when he's even when he's getting like obliterated. Even during yeah. the segments of this match where uh Otani is dog walking his ass, there's still just like this just this look on his face, man. Even if you can't see his face, even if his his face is covered because Otani's beating the shit out of it, there's just something about Murakami as a guy, <laughs> just as a presence. It's like, dude, oh man, <laughs> oh man. I think the only time yeah. he ever didn't have that feeling was when he started wearing the suit in Noah. Yeah, <laughs> I will say, like, fucking, there is genuinely like fucking Murakami like brawls, especially, but just Murakami matches in general. Yeah. There's a real feeling of. When is Murakami gonna snap? Like, because you we all know it like happens eventually. And Murakami from the start is like a sick fucker. He just goes in there throwing fucking punches, uh, laughing at people. The fucking corner stomp that he does is egregious. It's fucking amazing. But there's always this moment in every Murakami match where you just kinda like he just kinda gets pushed mm-hmm. and he snaps. And every time it happens. It's like witnessing the fucking fury of hell rain down on another wrestler. Because Murakami is a furious god of a wrestler. 
He is so, so hateful, so full of spite and vitriol and more words like that. He's just such a piece of shit. There's just so much about him in this match that is, like, awful. And I say that as a person that loves him. And I, I say that positively. He is just so, so evil. He's so evil. <laughs> Honestly, and this is crazy too because I don't think he even has that much. I think Otani controls more of his match, if I'm not mistaken. No, he does. And I just, as an Murakami is a special wrestler who, honestly, I feel like uh, what you were saying about him snapping, my favorite thing about him is that snap usually coincides with him throwing his mouthpiece at his opponent. Yeah. Yeah, and he'll just that's his uh that's his strap that's his straps are down you know that's that's his fucking that's his spinach. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's not just a moment of him being like I'm about to fuck you up. It's a moment of him being like I'm about to fuck you up, and I do not care about the repercussions of my actions. If you fuck me up yeah. harder, I'm just going to keep going until you're done. Yeah. And that's the type of mindset but, you can only have if you're cousin Armor Yeah, you and can, I think you uh, if you're not cousin Armor Mikami. No, no. And I think that it's the, one of the big things with Murakami is that just he is. Me and Ethan have talked about Murakami a lot. Uh, <laughs> Murakami, I I don't know how he ranks in Ethan's mind. I have a strong guess that what I'm about to say he agrees with. Uh, Murakami is like one of the best wrestlers ever to me. I genuinely love him. He's one of my favorite wrestlers ever. Uh, and part of that is because Murakami is, to one of the most pure extents, an outsider. Uh, like, when he was getting into the business, because he, he probably came into this with some thoughts of, I'm, you know, I'd like to be a wrestler. He did not come into New Japan, or come into the Anokiverse wanting to be a wrestler. He yeah. came into there wanting to be an MMA fighter. He joined UFO, which was the fucking MMA division, MMA weird something company. I don't UFO was strange. I don't think anyone's really sure what it was, but nope. the guys that were part of it were, were planning to be MMA fighters, so like an Ogawa and Murakami, and I think there were a few others. Um, you know, they come in, and Murakami's here to be an M uh, MMA fighter, and he gets brought in for, you know, to work New Japan, because Ogawa, Ogawa is being evil and beating up Hashimoto, uh, and they're like, hey, Murakami, come on. Uh, one of the most fascinating things about Murakami War is that when he comes in, he's like, okay, I'm here. I should train to wrestle. Inoki finds out that he wants to do this, and Inoki forbids him from learning how to wrestle. Uh, <laughs> so all of the early Murakami matches, from what I understand, he has no training at all. Because Inoki wanted him to be a pure MMA fighter. Uh, and just wanted him to go in there and beat people up for real. Because Inoki was like, this will be incredible. This would be, this is what you are meant to be, and I don't want you to muddy that down by learning how to wrestle. Mm -hmm. So, which I think is genuinely, like, like, you know, to, you, to a certain extent, you can say, like, oh, that might not be okay. <laughs> you know, you're oh, that's sending, <laughs> sending, <laughs> sending, and, okay, listen, you do have to agree, to a certain extent, maybe it's a little fucked up to send in an actual MMA fighter to legitimately beat up your contracted workers. Yes, close. Um, <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's that's, true. Hey, hey, you got me there, buddy. You got me there. Uh, okay. I got but it. it's, 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 it's fascinating. It's genuinely fascinating to think about that this guy just comes in and just beats people up. This fucking in this match, he is twenty eight years old. He is he debuted in ninety eight for UFO. He probably wasn't. He probably wasn't trained at all during that period. He's yeah. been wrestling for a few years now. At this point, I assume he does have some level of training. Because I know Murakami himself wanted training. He's like, I feel really bad about this. <laughs> and I want to get trained. Um, and I think, I think Naoya Ogawa ends up helping him to get trained. Because fucking Inoki was like, you're not doing it. Um, but even then... No matter when he got the training or not, you would not be able to tell when he got it, really. Because, oh, based off of this match, at least. Because Murakami, like, retains that feeling of being, like, an entire outsider. 
and Mur- Kazunori Murakami is not a wrestler. He no. doesn't feel like a wrestler. Now, he, he does feel like a wrestler. There's a certain sect of wrestling that I feel like he slots in perfectly. Mm-hmm. But, and like at his core, he, he has the wrestler spirit. But everything he does is like against wrestling. And this is a match that is entirely him versus a wrestler. Uh, and I think it's really fascinating that that wrestler tries to fight Murakami by also abandoning wrestling because this is Shingeki and I'm also going to punch you in the face. Um, okay, I have a question for you. I'm sorry to interrupt your train of thought, but I was just thinking this for one moment. Uh, yeah. Do you think mm-hmm. as an arm, the reason, or one of the reasons, because we can't ever get inside of the mind of the great Antonio Inoki, may he rest in yeah. peace. Uh, do you think one of the reasons that he told Murakami not to get training was because he saw the vision of Murakami being the ultimate version, which he essentially is, of the Anti-Players Association? This is a question for me, right? Just to make sure. You or Cake, if Cake has seen enough APA. Okay, I was, I was wondering. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave it to, I think I'll leave the drama. I think he knows this certain field better than I do. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think, I think, I don't know if, I don't know, because I don't, I don't think he sat there and thought, hmm, if I don't train him, it'll be the ultimate version of the Anti-Players Association. I don't think he thought that, per se. His, that. Th- his line of thinking was in line, though, because, again, yeah, that's what a I very mean. important note with uh, Inoki. Uh, strong style is, this is strong style. This is legitimately strong style. I, okay. This match specifically, I actually would say kind of isn't, because it is Otani, a pro wrestler, fighting back with basically worked MMA. I thought worked is a strong word there. <laughs> word. Uh, worked is a strong word, but, you know, uh, MMA type something, I don't know what you'd say. Fighting back with not pure wrestling, uh, which I think would kind of go against the idea of strong stuff. Just to fucking clarify, uh, Strong style is not just people hitting hard. Uh, no. That's, I mean, I will say strong style also is just uh, bro, you marketing. Bro, you did not even it's... Play what strong style is for this podcast. Everybody knows. No, 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 no. I know, I know, brother. I know, I know. Just fucking. But it, the idea of strong style, as it originally was, of wrestling versus MMA, or wrestling versus martial arts. Wrestling is the strongest martial art. Murakami, in essence was kind of built to be the final boss of proving that wrestling is stronger than uh, mar- other martial arts. O- Ogawa is the final boss, but Murakami is the final boss as bastard son. So <laughs> he's the uh, he's the he's the deuteragonist in a way. Yeah. Would you say the uh, the final boss is underling who wants to stab him in his sleep with the Yoshihiro Takayama then? I, I think Takayama is too wrestle built. I will say I think Takayama is actually a great representation of someone who kind of works as a you know you could he's the type of guy that would be at the negotiation table between martial arts and wrestling and be like the peacekeeper. Yeah, and <laughs> like, that's why he's the underhanded one. He's the one who's trying to do all the like some of the shady dealings that the old guard might not like. I think, yeah, I think, because I think the thing with Takayama more than anything is that Takayama is just, uh, Takayama is Takayama. He was raised in a shoot style environment, uh, to the point that they basically tried to raise him as an MMA fighter. Uh, they put him, <laughs> very famously, they put him in an MMA fight against, uh, Kimo Leopoldo on a UWFI show, uh, where he died. I have seen that match. He dies crazy. Kimo kills him. It is horrifying. Uh, I think that's when they realized maybe we shouldn't throw our uh, trainees into the wolves against actual MMA fighters. Oh, says uh, <laughs> says fucking says, says, says Glate. <laughs> says fucking Glate, brother. Um, I think that's but, the famous uh, MMA fight Yoshihiro Takayama ever had in his life, right? That is true. Yeah, no, he, he never... After the after the chemo fight, he never fought in MMA again. Um, Can you imagine if but, he was up against, like, uh, um, Great Pot? I didn't think of anybody. <laughs> Imagine if he was against Don Fry. That'd be crazy. Huh? Oh my god. <laughs> um, but no, just fucking... I think Takayama's kind of a middle ground. 
Yeah. Uh, but Murakami, meanwhile, is not only is he all oh, the fucking final boss of Strong Style or whatever the fuck I was saying, he's also just awful. Uh, an awful, awful person. Um, I think that there is so much in this match that feels almost wrong. Like, this is a this is like a bar fight, almost. It's, it's you know, bar fight with gloves and with corner men and a fucking 50,000, fucking whatever thousand seat arena. I would but it, it, Ooh, oh, okay. I would, I would, but I'll, 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 I'll want to finish your, finish your thought. It's fine. I mean, I would just say that this feels very, I, I guess bar fight isn't the best way to put it, because yes. bar fight would imply yes. that's more, it's more, I don't know how you'd yeah, fucking I think, verbalize I think, it. I think it's still like, it's still definitely a fight, but I, I wouldn't call it like a bar fight or anything like that, because there's a lot of prolonged holds, and more importantly than that, there's a lot of spike. And if you were fighting a dude in a bar, you would not be spiteful. You would just be yeah. in his face. Whereas, yeah. it, there definitely feels, at least in Otani's case, much like there is in a lot of things with Otani's case, they... He just feels like a guy who's very much trying to prove something. Like He's very much trying to prove yeah. like, yo, Murakami, uh, you know, pro wrestling is the strongest guy. When I'm going to kill you, you're going to die. So I don't, think <laughs> he, I don't think it could be considered a bar fight. I'm trying to think of what a better term for it would be. Oh, and... I think I found it. I think I found oh, please. it. Please, what do you say? It was... I think this is a street fight between two high schoolers who fucking hate each other over That's some. That's crazy because I was going to say that. I was actually. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody in stole brain, something. In my brain, I was like, yeah, this feels like this feels like the type of fight where like one high schooler like shoulder checks another guy in the cafeteria, and they just. Um, immediately the cafeteria yeah it, it, it like the ending ties that all together where murakami goes against the rules quote unquote and just starts beating the shit out of them without gloves on and people literally have to pull him off and then Otani yeah. <laughs> comes like he wakes up and he's like where the fuck is he i want to beat the shit out of him still yeah <laughs> it's it's just like it's world star before world star yeah, that's that is a yeah, that's that's basically exactly that that's exactly fucking correct. I fully agree with that. Uh and I think that that is really strong. I think also we do I do we we do need to bring up the fucking uh the pre-match stuff that's shown in the video uh of Murakami just bursting into the zero one one dojo and just immediately trying to fucking beat the shit out of Otani just like going straight for him. Uh, all those stuff shown of, you know, Murakami murking Yuki Ishikawa on a Battle Arts show. Um, just everything about this match. Yeah. Everything about this match is just built like, like Murakami and Otani are two guys who just can't get along. In any, any fucking world, they can't get along because there's such a strong, like, divide not only like, oh, there's a strong divide in their own ideologies. They just fucking hate each other. Mm -hmm. They can't stand each other. And this match feels like the culmination of that. Especially in the, you know, the the gloves thing. Which, that kind of comes from the bar fight thing. Because I fucking, I read a Sekunda Kaeda review, like, a while ago. Where they talked about a match that I really fucking love from a Wrestle Yume Factory. And the ending of the match goes into, like, a like a DQ. And it gets, like, fucking... All the guys involved just start trying to kill each other. And I think... I think it was... It might have been Phil. I think it was Phil Schneider who... Uh, described the finish as... It feels like it was a bar fight that went wrong because someone pulled a gun. Yeah. That's kind of how I felt with the Murakami pulling the gloves off. It feels like at that point, Murakami has, like... Given up any attempt at really just fighting... Like, he's given up any attempt at care. Yeah, like he he's oh, he's care. pulling out the this is the this is the last resort. He's done trying to just win. Now he just wants to legitimately kill Shinjiro Otani. The best way possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing finish. Like it's absolutely insane. There's <laughs> it. It generally feels like as Murakami's rising, like like post glove taking off, he's just getting up to his feet. There's just this aura about him that just feels like. He just has made up his mind that he's going to make a mistake right now. <laughs> yes. 
He's so stoked about it. I, I, yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Because it looked like the second he starts taking the gloves off, you kind of know what's going to happen. You, you don't kind of, you know exactly what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, it's just you're waiting for it to happen, which is like honestly one of the scariest feelings ever. Of you, <laughs> you know, shit is about to hit the fan in the worst possible way. Things are about to escalate to a point that they can't go back down from. And you just have to sit there and watch it happen. And you're just waiting until the moment. And, of course, the moment is when he throws the glove in Otani's face and just punches him in the jaw. Just straight up punches him in the jaw. That's so insane. Just full fist, straight to the jaw, mount to position, and just starts raining down close to his punches. Fucking, I think it's Yuji Shimada, who's the referee, fucking jumps on top. He doesn't even try to, like, break it up, per se. He just he's jumps on top of Murakami. He's trying to choke Murakami he's out. Trying to ch- he's trying to choke Murakami out. He's fucking going, ring the bell, ring the bell. The entire Zero One roster rushes to the ring to try and rip Murakami off of Otani's carcass. It is horrifying. <laughs> and the fact that it ends with such an escalation is nuts. Because the beginning of the match has that same moment of, oh, shit's about to hit the fan. When Otani yeah. slaps Murakami at the very beginning, and they just start teeing off on each other, Fry Takayama style, before Fry Takayama, without the head. That never happened. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that that never what, happened. what are you talking about, brother? But it's um, just, uh, it's like, I don't know. It has, it feels like a match that should just peak in those opening moments, but it's not. Yeah. I think that that kind of goes into the whole thing of, you know, we talk, I, I mentioned with the, uh, the escalation of like, it's escalated to a point you go, can't go back down from. This match is entirely escalation, but it's not like escalation of the moves are getting crazier. Cause the, really the only moves in this match are punches what? and stomps to the head. But what's escalating is each guy's respective amount of anger and amount of being fed up. Like you can, watch on their faces as they just get more and more pissed off and like i'm not gonna fucking i'm not gonna take this shit it just starts wailing on each other uh great great moment of that is the murakami throw in the mouth guard great moment of that is when murakami follows otani to the outside and just starts punt kicking him on the floor (laughs) great moment of that is when otani has murakami like his head's like dangling off the apron Otani walks on the apron and punt kicks him in the face. Yeah. It's just constantly, the match constantly keeps getting like worse. I mean that like in a, in a good way. It just keeps, it, it keeps getting more and more to the point of like, it's going beyond acceptability until you get to the end, which is we have gone into a territory that cannot, you know, you can't go back from this. Moida. Absolutely Moida. I think that was a point that you brought up when we were actually watching it that I wanted to bring up as well, which is just that like, at some point after Murakami goes crazy mode on the outside, he just chills on the inside. <laughs> Not necessarily because he wants like any like cheap victory. He just wants to say that he beat him on the inside. Yeah. Like, yes. It is very much a a, a, a point proving driven match at his heart of just like, yeah, I hate you. I really, really, really do. But even more than hating you, I really want you to I, I I want you to feel some sort of way about me, and yeah, like underneath all the hate, the drive to make them think that about you is, I think, even more compelling in both these guys' brains. I think that, and honestly, I think that, and I think we kind of talked about this previously with another match. I can't remember what it was. Um, it, it was fucking Joe Homicide. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think to a certain extent, you could argue that. Murakami lost the match. Well, he did. He did lose the match as a DQ. <laughs> but both literally and mentally, Murakami lost because there is that moment where he goes back in the ring and is like, I want you to get back in here so I can beat the shit out of you and win. Because he could have just continued to beat the shit out of him on the outside. He had Otan. Um, but he wanted him back in. And then he takes the gloves off and gets himself disqualified. He, at that point, was no longer going beyond hate. The hate had become so much that's all he cared about. So, in a way, he gave up on winning in any sense because he was getting too hateful. God bless, honestly. God bless. 
Yeah, well, that's what that's what we fucking need in wrestling. We need guys that fucking snap <laughs> and punch each other in the face. Yes, that is please. what we need. That is what we need. We need that more than anything ever, at all times, always. <laughs> I'm so glad this episode went from uh, Shinjiro Otani agenda pushing to Kazunari Murakami agenda pushing because that was my original plan for this episode. And we yeah. have two birds with one stone. Yeah, let's yeah. get it for ourselves. Yeah, I fucking I I do genuinely think that the um just as you go back to because again, as you say, that was the point of the the podcast coming into you know, but when we start recording, there is so much to love about Shinjiro Otani in both of these matches. Mm-hmm. Um, I think especially, because we talked a ton about how much he did in the Samurai match. Um, and I, you know, we talked about his facial expressions and the way he is. I think in this match, he is like, like, it all works here. Like, it never feels in any way overdramatic. And he's still kind of doing those, those faces. Oh, yeah. But... To a much lesser extent. Yeah, it, it's, it feels a lot more... Not just appropriate, but also like earned in a way. Because mm-hmm. I think that the the big thing with a lot of these faces is that some of them are so insane. When we talk about fucking NXT and shit, which I feel like we we've, we've brought up on like every episode, which is fucking yeah. we, we we don't we should. But with some of the with some of that stuff, just with some American indie stuff, with some fucking Japanese wrestling stuff, don't even fucking yeah. get me started. Uh, they'll do facial expressions that in there's no way to earn that, like. Theoretically, the only way you could earn that is if, like, you shot him with a gun and they kicked yeah. out. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I think to a certain extent, Otani does kind of tap into that uh, in the samurai match. Even if I do think that it's, you know, that's just him. That's all. That's how he always is. He's fully committed. Even then, I still think he kind of taps into it. In this match, all of the facial expressions feel appropriate and earned, even if they are still Otani facial expressions. Mm-hmm. And I, I know this is like completely unintentionally didn't mean to, but it's really funny at the ending because when we were watching it, the number one thing that stuck out to me about the ending was when Otani gets punched. He just completely on accident pulls like a Jim from the office stares at camera moment. Yeah, straight <laughs> down the hard cam. It's so funny. Yeah, and he just gets hit and he looks like uh like Bugs Bunny is staring at the viewer because he just has a <laughs> stick of dynamite in his hand or something. That's a it's so it's a great way it's, <laughs> it's so a great way to put it when he fucking you know he gets he does that and then you know oh, fucking Murk comes on top of him Shabazz on top of him the, the entire Z1 roster's on top of him and then everyone gets pried off and the camera goes like rings mode like above camera and he's doing the Family Guy death pose it's so good it's, it's so, so funny, good dude, it's like it's so funny because like yeah it's just like. All the hell is about to get, get let loose on his poor body, mind, and soul. But just before that happens, he just stares at the camera. <laughs> He's like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Like what have I got myself into this time? <laughs> if, you, if you took that video, or if you took the ending, and you just put a gulp sound effect when he looks at the camera, <laughs> it wouldn't be that unbecoming. <laughs> Murakami raises up a little flag that says "Uh oh" on it. <laughs> <laughs> slide whistle. Like, slide whistle. When when he hits the ground, slide whistle pulls back. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, okay. I think I think the next plan of attack is somebody needs to make a silent film edit of a really famous like murder match. If somebody, <laughs> if somebody puts the time and effort to make like a 1920s silent comedy edit of a match like this, that would maybe be the peak of all wrestling content forever. Okay, there's a very specific song I needed to be to. I forget the name, but it's do 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 Oh my god, yeah, I know exactly what you're fucking talking about. That fucking that was that was horrifying. That, that song, yeah, the entertainment. That fucking song was everywhere on YouTube videos yeah. in the early 2010s. I not, cannot escape that song. Exactly that song, but it, it should be. It that. is a, it's a Kevin McCarthy song, yeah. It should be that song for sure. I yeah. Can imagine like the uh, like the Looney Tunes like sledgehammer sound on some of the kicks. Or something. <laughs> oh, 
Honk. Oh, Dude, imagine we we should get more wrestling uh and put Kevin McLeod songs in the background <laughs> to the matches. Oh, you know what I could uh you could probably do this if you spent long enough and wanted to. You could like after Kazunari Murakami gets dropped on his head or hit on his head and there's like a face, like a close up of his face, you could give him that uh cartoon bump on the top of his head and then the birds fly around. <laughs> <him. laughs> And the birds! <laughs> dude, dude, can you imagine, uh, like, uh, I don't know what part it would be. If, like, in one of the parts where uh, Otani has, like, one of those, like, really hellish holds in on his leg. Like, the part where, like, he's reeling back so hard that he loses his balance and has to reset himself. Oh, my if, God! If, if it just, like, uh, if it, like, hard cut to, like, you know, one of, like, the title cards, it just says, ow, on it. Dude, okay. I just gotta say, because we didn't mention that at all. Like there is a there's a portion of the match near the beginning where Otani is just trying to like attack Murakami's leg, which is also crazy because fucking the samurai match attacked the leg and he gets a point he knows like the samurai match. There's a lot of parallels between yeah. the two matches. Um and I think that it's interesting that Samurai and Murakami approach this type of Murakami or this type of Otani in an entirely different way. Uh but that's beside the point. When he's fucking working that leg, he has him in, like, a single leg crab, and he grabs, like, the top of Murakami's knee and, like, tries to rip it backwards. Sick. And I was, like, I had to, I almost had to look away. I was like, this is fucked up. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I forgot about that until you said that, and I do think that an owl screen would be very fitting. <laughs> Can you pull the video up again real quickly? I just want to watch him get punched in the head at the ending again real fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, of course. Let me... I, I... Also, I just thought of, like, Esque sound effect uh, addition to a video that you could do. I'll do after we after we watch this. I just okay, let me out again and then see him do the gym from the office to the camera one. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, if I let me, let me let me turn it down a little bit. Uh, it's so funny. Also, John, can I uh, direct you to a YouTube video so I can put sound effects on as well? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah, actually, let me let me try to. <laughs> oh, oh my God! Yeah, oh really no! Just... 